Can you hear me? Yes. All right. All right. Welcome to the New Orleans Jazz Museum. I want to thank you for coming here. On behalf of New Orleans Jazz National Historical Park, we want to thank you for supporting these programs. The mission of our park is to instill an appreciation for New Orleans jazz music and the musicians who continue to carry the torch. Uh, usually on Thursday we have a piano hour, but we're switching things up uh, with a special guest today. We have Mr. Barry Martin, who is a drummer, um, I believe born in London, but came to New Orleans in the 60s. And so his talk is going to center around drummers from the 60s and just the legacy of New Orleans drummers. We're so delighted to also have Miss Kate here, um, who's also a drummer, and I believe she's from Toronto. And so she's going to be sharing her expertise in her style and sharing her knowledge. And again, we're so grateful to have such a wonderful wealth um, of musicians who just share their art and craft. So I'm going to get out the way and let the masters take it away. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, uh, can you hear me all right? Okay, if I'm talking too quietly, say speak up, and I will, you know. But if you say stand up, I can't. I've got a broken ankle, but uh, it's all right. But for a drummer, I play drums with bass drum with the left foot, so it don't interfere with nothing. But it's still a bit painful. But uh, So where are your people from? I know where you're from. Where are you in the third row when they were little girls? Where are you all from? Memphis, Tennessee. Well, I'll be doggone. And you? Brazil. Brazil. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Welcome there. We're glad you could make it. And the people just came in. We're glad anybody could make it. Sometimes we talk to ourselves down here, you know. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, supposed to be about New Orleans drummers. That's what we're here to speak about. And um, uh, I want to kind of wait for about 10 minutes and see if we get a bigger crowd because I don't want to tell the same story twice. But uh, if you've got any questions, don't, don't be scared to ask, you know. The last time we played here, man, it was about 200 people. Yep. I wonder they must be giving away free beer somewhere. Good God. <laughs> so you people are glad to be in New Orleans? Me too. I've been here since January the 8th, 1961. It was a long time. And I came here when I was 19, a little baby. I came from London, England, and uh, came here. And Miss Kate here, this lady, she's my drum student. She, uh, well, I'd, I'd never had too many students, but uh, she's very bright and Fix things up real quick and real easy, you know. And uh, but anyway, I guess I could tell the same story twice if I have to. But, but uh, <laughs> there was uh, uh, when I wanted to come to New Orleans, you couldn't come to the United States from England. It wasn't allowed unless you was a millionaire or something like that. And uh, I had to go to Canada, and they paid your airfare to go to Canada. They wanted people to, to uh, go there. And so uh, I went into Montreal, Canada. And I soon got to play with the local band there. I forget the name of that band. Yeah, it's a yeah. good jazz town. Huh? Montreal's a good jazz town. Oh, yeah. And it was then, too, you know. But I wanted to get to New Orleans. I mean, where the real jazz... Well, I shouldn't say real jazz, but... Uh, I played in Montreal for, I stayed there for about nine months and it got too much. I said, I've got to get myself to New Orleans. And so uh, I got a bus, got off at a place called Rouse's Point and I walked out across the fields uh, for about a mile and I saw a man digging up some cabbages and I said, Pardon me, sir, is this the United States? And he looked at me as if I was a bit goofy. And he said, uh, well, of course it's the United States. Where do you think it is? I said, that's all I need to know. Okay, go back to digging up your cabbages. 
And I walked and got a bus into New York City. And uh, I had one of the greatest drummers that I ever came across in my entire life who got to be a friend. His name was Arthur Zudi Singleton. Anybody ever heard of him, Zudi Singleton? He made many records with Louis Armstrong. And, uh, oh, he's in the film New Orleans. And um, anyway, I called him and I said, Mr. Singleton, my name is Barry Martin. I'm a drummer from London. And he said, when are you all coming over? I said, coming over where? He said, to the house. I said, what do you mean I can come there? I mean, he was world famous, you know. And he said, sure. He said, you catch a cab and... I said, well, I ain't got much money. I can't catch a cab. I walked there. Where is it? He says, right across from Birdland. Birdland was the place where all the bebop was played, mm -hmm. you know. And so I walked there, knocked on the door, and uh, they buzzed me in, and he was waiting at the elevator. He said, I'm Zudi Singleton, a drummer. I said, I know exactly who you are. He said, yeah. How you know that? I said, well, I'm a young drummer. I'm a student, and, uh, you know. He said, well, come on up and meet my wife. And he we took the elevator, and he walked me through this hallway, and there was pictures on the wall of him with Louis Armstrong's Hot Five and stuff. And I said, oh, look, here. That's Kid Ori, and that's it. He said, you've been here before. I said, no, man, this is a world-famous picture. Oh. And so... We went into this room with the lights, daylight, and he said, this is my wife, Marge. She's married to a St. Louis trumpet player. And I said, I know, Charlie Kreth. He said, how oh, you know that? You must have been here before. I said, no, I follow jazz and I study about the people that made it, you know. And uh, Charlie Kreth was a famous trumpet player from St. Louis. And uh, and Zudi said, look here, come look at this window. He said, down there, look, see that? That's Birdland. It was where Charlie Parker played and Dizzy Gillespie and all the poppers. And I said, well, I ain't too big on that kind of music. I don't know much about that, but let's talk. And uh, about four hours later, we got, he said, I'm tired of talking. He said, let's get a drink. What do you drink? I said, uh, there's water. And he said, you don't want nothing to drink? Bourbon or something? I said, no, man, just... They give you a glass. I never had these bottles in those days. This was 1961, January the 7th. And he said, so you're going to New Orleans? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, quit calling me sir. <laughs> I mean, it's just where I come from. You referred to out as in that term, but he didn't want that. And uh, he said, I said, well, I'd like to get some drum lessons. Do you give drum lessons? No, man, he said, I can't teach. And uh, Kate is a, she's learning, I'm teaching her a few things about drums now. She's a good drummer of her own right. Tell them where you come from and all that. Um, so I'm from Toronto originally, um, up in Canada. Uh, I actually started drumming um, when I w lived in Colorado for about six years. Uh, it's a funny little mountain town with not a lot of people. And uh, we started, my friend started this blues jam actually in town. And um, I'd only sat at the trap kit a couple times, but I'd been playing on my steering wheel for years and years. And playing on a like, steering wheel? Yeah, I learned on my steering wheel. What do you wheel. mean, a steering wheel? Yeah, I was driving along, listening to the radio, and tapping along. And so I got my coordination that way. I'll and then, uh, yeah, and it was a funny, funny thing. Like, so my friend was like, well, I want to start this blues jam, but I don't have a drummer. And I'm like, yeah, I could figure it out. So, you know, we called a couple of friends in town. We're like, do you have a tom? Do you have a snare? And we got this horrendous kit, this Frankenstein drum kit together <laughs> and, uh, and played our first gig like that. And it sounded really good. So they just kept asking me back. And then, um, yeah, it just sort of unfolded like that, just playing with, uh, a lot of different people in that community. There's all kinds of different music. Uh, there's jazz, there's blues, there's like, you know, all kinds of rock and roll, classic rock, and pretty much anything you'd want to play. Uh, so it was really good to get my chops up. And then um, my best friend lives down here, 
who actually brought me to Colorado for a sort of every couple of years I seem to follow her around. And uh, she's actually a really good uh, jazz trombone player who she now plays in Barry's band as well. Um, oh, you're talking about Miss Lindsay. Hello there. Yeah. Glad you could make it. Yeah, and uh, so I came to visit, uh, I guess, last year and just fell in love with the town and has been like playing with a bunch of different uh, bands and musicians. And actually, I, I got offered a gig playing in a marching band, an all-female marching band, last year for the April Fool's Parade. And they were like, oh, but do you have a bass drum? And I'm like, mm, I don't know. So I called Barry upstairs because I live below him. And, uh, and he was like, yeah, I got a bass drum. I'm a bass drum player, too. So I was like, oh, perfect. Okay, great. And this thing is like 100 years old. You're going to have to tell the story about where that drum came from. Well, you know, I'm a, just a little thing, too. And I got this, this ancient drum with one crusty old strap on me. Walking down Frenchman, the thing weighs about as much as I do. So, yeah, where'd that drum well, come I from? I know that, that drum's real light. I might pick it up with one finger. But, yeah. then, oh, man, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but now... Uh, the drum itself came from a drummer called Paul Barberin. Anybody ever heard of Paul Barberin? You. Okay. You ain't in the family, are you? No, I've been living here 38 years. Oh, yeah. Well, you didn't know. But Paul was a wonderful cat, cat man. He was a great drummer. He played with Louis Armstrong and uh, made records with all kind of people. King Oliver and Jesus, Jelly Roll, Morton, all kind of people. And he um, he befriended me, and uh, he said, "Come down and play tomorrow night. We're playing. What was that jazz club called that used to be opposite the? Oh man, it's right on Bourbon Street. Anyway, the one with the swinging lady legs. It was a different one. No, not the one where the lady's legs comes out. Yeah. No, that was. Uh, who said that? Good the God. voice from beyond. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See if we trip up. That man, I guess it's a man. I never... What did he say? I don't know. What did you say again? <laughs> the famous door. Yeah, right across from the famous door. Yeah. <laughs> Must be the voice of the Lord. <laughs> but anyway, Paul's band was playing there. And he let me sit in. He said, let this boy sit in. I was... 19, I think, at the time. Well, I was a boy, you know. Now I'm 81, but I sat in with him. The band was Kid Howard on the trumpet, Louis Cottrell on the clarinet, Frog Joseph, Waldron Frog Joseph on the trombone, um, and Paul was on the drums, and Lester San Diego was at the piano, and Placid Adam was on the bass. And I started out, they started playing something, and I started boom, 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 boom. And Kid Howard turned around and he said, play two beats. And Frog Joe said, play two beats on that goddamn drum. And I, I, I thought, I guess they're talking to me, there wasn't no other drummer on the stage. And uh, so they didn't want the da 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 they wanted da 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 And so I soon picked up. And Paul Barberin came back and he said, don't be so hard on this boy. I remember when you didn't know what the hell you were doing on them instruments, you know, all of you. And he was a wonderful guy, And uh, but he died on the street parade. He was playing on the street parade and he just grabbed his heart and had to sit down and he died. Right there on, um, well, I could take you to it, but I forget what, it's on, uh, no, I'm terrible with names. but. Uh, yeah, it was Royal and uh, somewhere down there. And Paul just died, right? Oh. That was the end of him. <laughs> but, but, but he played drums with King Oliver. He played drums with Jelly Roll Morton. He played with all of them, you know. He was a real nice... It's probably nice. a pretty good way to die as a jazz musician, though. Huh? It's probably a pretty good way to die as a jazz musician, you know, yeah, while you're so. marching. Well, I played in many marching bands, but I sure never died on one, you know. <laughs> I played with a lot of guys who were half dead, but was, you know we used to play those those, those jobs, brass band jobs, and uh, across the river. So you couldn't sit in if you were white. You couldn't sit in with what they called a coloured band. Here the cops would arrest you. Uh, don't ask. I don't know. 
I mean, I came from London, them bombs dropping on you, you went down there with anybody, I don't care who it was, you were glad to get somewhere safe. But down here it was pretty different. So, but across the river, Alfred Williams was a great drummer from here, Alfred Williams. And uh, he said, when we go across the river, you sit in and play snare drum with the brass band. I said, well, you sure I'd be all right? He said, yeah, man. And uh, I played the whole parade. Lasted about four hours. And I came back there, and there was Alfred. <laughs> fast asleep in the car. And he said, man, you sounded great with that band. <laughs> I mean, but he, he, you know, he was a nice guy. And um, the two best drummers here were Josiah Frazier and Alfred Williams. And I took lessons with Josiah Frazier. Uh, I went to his house, and I was 18, 19, I don't know, I forget. And uh, he had his drum set up, and uh, on the front of it was the initials DG, and his name was Josiah Frazier. And I'm thinking, what the... I said, why you got DG on your drums? He said, it means damn good. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding you, that's what he said. And... Uh, he said, you sit down and play. Let me hear you play a waltz. Let me hear you play a polka. I didn't know what he was talking about, you know. I, I just, well, I knew how to play a waltz, you know. But he said, I said, I want you to give me drum lessons. And he said, yeah, but we can't do it here. It was an old black neighborhood. And uh, didn't wonder what I was doing there, coming there every week. So we had it at Bill Russell's store. Bill Russell was a jazz enthusiast from, originally from Canton, Missouri. And uh, he, um, he he had a store, a little record store, right directly across from where Preservation Hall is now. So Josiah, Sai, I called him, everybody called him Sai, brought his drums there every, every week and taught me for about four hours. And when my money ran out, he still kept teaching me. He said, oh, you can pay me later. You've got good promise. And I suppose I winded up. I mean, I've been lucky in my life. Hello there. Is that a customer or is he working the microphones? I swear. Oh, he just worked there. Okay. <laughs> well, we're glad to see anybody. So um, anyway, where was I? Uh, I'm talking about Bill Russell. Oh, Bill Russell's, yeah. And so he brought his drums there for me to play on the whole time. And he made me go over things till I had them. No, 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 no. That ain't right. He had a sort of stutter. I, I ain't got to keep, keep, keep telling you this. God damn it. Hit that bass drum on the certain second, first and third beats. And I grasped what he was saying after a while. And uh, he was a wonderful teacher. And... Uh, in later years, I've got to tell you this, it's not, nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I had a band called The Legends of Jazz. We played for two presidents, Ronald Reagan and uh, Gerald Ford. And, uh, but that's a different story. We played up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You know the Hall Brothers Jazz Band mm -hmm. comes from there? They had a big jazz club there, and it was packed and jammed. There wasn't nothing else to do. Well, anybody here from Minneapolis? There wasn't much else to do in Minneapolis, so uh, that's why the jazz club was packed. So anyway, my drum professor, they had the Preservation Hall Band going then. It wasn't when I first came here, but they got it going later. Alan Jaffe, he was a bass horn player. He led the band. And Percy Humphrey, the trumpet player, and Willie Humphrey, his brother, the clarinet player, and Saif, Josiah Frazier, my drum teacher, they came to where we played. And uh, I said, Say, come on, play with the band. That would be my dream come true, to have my teacher play with my band, you know. It was all colored band, you know, there wasn't no white people in it. And uh, he played, and I thought it sounded great. It's on a film, you can check the film. I wish I knew something about these modern, I can't tell them what to go look for but it's somewhere on the internet. And uh, I asked him in the band, what did you think? 
I thought they were going to say, he's great, fabulous. And uh, the trumpet player, Andy Blaney, said, oh, he plays too loud. And the clarinet player said, he got no taste. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the piano player, he was from New Orleans, Alton Purnell. He liked him. And the old bass player, he said, I couldn't hear a note I played with that damn man. So whether they were just being nice because it was my band, I don't know, but uh, I couldn't believe it. And uh, there's a bit of a come down when you get your teacher to sit in and play with your band and your band criticizes him, you know. But uh, I guess things were very different then. Everything was different, you know. I mean, New Orleans wasn't the same as it is now. How many people is from New Orleans? Nobody here? I think the dog. Well, that shows you. I mean, I think the sound man maybe is. No, he's from, he just told us, he's from Chicago, isn't he? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you people having a good time in the city? Yeah. It's a great city to be around in, you know. I mean, uh, things still go on here that you never see anywhere else. And Mardi Gras coming up soon. And uh, that's a very special time. I mean, uh, you've been here for Mardi Gras? No, last year I missed it, actually. It's you you missed Mardi, Mardi Gras? Gras? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good heavens above. Imagine somebody coming to New Orleans and missing Mardi Gras. I missed it by like a week too, apparently. So. Oh, good yeah. God. <laughs> well, I used to work until I had this, um, whatever this thing's called, what's it called? Um, pandemic? Mm -hmm. Pandemic or whatever it's called. Until they had that, I used to work all the time, Mardi Gras, you know. If you get so tired of working that we, uh, you know, Okay, you coming back or not? Okay. He said we might. Yeah, I think we lost him. Yeah, I think we lost him. Well, they were little bitty kids to them, and the daddy was looking after them. I guess it was their daddy. But, um, yeah, Mardi Gras is coming up now, shortly. And there'll still be parades, and they still got brass bands, but they're not the same. It was just different. I can't explain it. The beats... The whole thing is different, you know. I mean, yeah, Barry's a jazz purist for sure. So, well, in my day, they had three brass bands: the Eureka Brass Band, led by Percy Humphrey, the trumpet player, and uh, the Young Tuxedo Brass Band, led by E flat clarinet player John Casimir. And then they had the Gibson Brass Band. Where well, the Gibson Brass Band was a non-union brass band, or ununion, as they called it here. And uh, I don't know why I never could get it straight, non-union, un-union band. But, uh, and it worked. It wasn't as good as the other two. The Eureka Brass Band was phenomenal. And so was John Casimir's Young Tuxedo Band. If I would go across the river, hello there, welcome. Okay, uh, if I would go across the river, they'd let me sit in. Alfred Williams was a snare drum player with the Young Tuxedo Band. And he'd let me sit in. And he'd go to sleep in the car. And I played the whole parade, like six hours. And I'd come back. And he said, you enjoyed it? I said, yeah, man. He said, you sounded great. I mean, like he heard it. He just fell asleep in the car and got the money, you know. But uh, no, he was a good teacher. Uh, he wasn't my teacher, but he taught a lot of people how to play. But he had a very sparse drum outfit. He had the bass drum, the snare drum, and a sock cymbal, or a hi-hat, they call it, in Europe. That was all he had. And he would do everything just with that. And if he wanted to make a boom, boom, he didn't have tom-toms, he'd do it on the bass drum. Boom, boom, da da do de do da Boom, boom, da da do de da da You know, he was a, a, but his playing really pushed you. And then, Riverside Records came to town. There's a man called Herbert Friedward worked for him and he talked him, Riverside was a big company in those days, and he talked him into coming here. You heard those Riverside Records, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, I was at all the sessions. I went oh. every day, you know. It was over at uh, the Jeune Hall. Because uh, there was a, a lot of racial intolerance in those days here. Uh, unfortunately, and uh, 
we went into this hall and the band lined up and there were a few jazz fans there, Bill Russell, Dick Allen, Ralph Collins, people like that. And uh, there was some fabulous music, some really good music that they recorded, you know. And uh, they recorded, oh, I think about 10 LPs. And then the old man Peter Bokar, or Peter Bokar, as they called him here, he played with Armand J. Piron's orchestra, and he played trumpet and violin, and his brothers played instruments. And uh, he brought his violin along to one of the sessions. And I still get tears in my eyes when I listen to that Purple Rose of Cairo. It's beautiful, you know. And things like that, you never forget them. You can't forget them. I mean, things of beauty, like when you meet your wife, I suppose, you know, you can't forget her. And music is the same for a musician, you know, you just get so involved with it, you know. We were talking yesterday about how um, even being in a band is like being in a long-term marriage. And we were saying about uh, having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the same people. Yeah, yeah. Every day, so. Well, my band was called the Legends of Jazz, which was exactly what it was. Um, the trumpet player was Andrew Blakeney. Andrew Blakeney used to play with Kid Ora's band. And uh, Alton Purnell from New Orleans on the piano. Lewis Nelson on the trombone from New Orleans. Joe Darrensburg was, hey, welcome. Joe Darrensburg was on the clarinet. And uh, the bass player, when he joined the band, he was 88. Ed Garland, Montuli. This was in the 70s, right? Yeah, this was yeah. the 70s. And we played, well, we were lucky. We played for two presidents, you know, with that band. And, uh, oh, it was a great band. I mean, you, you never knew what was going to happen next, you know. But um, they were really, really, it was all colored band but me, you know. And, uh, I'll never forget, oh, I shouldn't tell you this, but what the devil. Anybody here from Texas? And I'll tell it. <laughs> we, I went into the, um, what do they call them here, bathroom, uh, and sat down. And these two Texans came, and I could see them through the crack of the door, and they were taking a, what do they call the proper way of urinating? And uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, he said, "What do you make of that band, Zeke? Oh, it's pretty good. That boy on the drums, he can't be white." <laughs> and another one said, uh, "Well, you know, a lot of our servicemen was over there, and the, he's from England. A lot of our servicemen was over there in the war, so maybe he's mixed. <laughs> mixed. <laughs> my father was a boxer from England, and my mother was a housewife from England. You know, I mean." Uh, and I grew up in the war years, but that tickled the devil out of me. Maybe he's mixed, you know. But um, it was funny being with a band like that, you know, because you learned so much. Every time you went out, you learned something more than you learned before, you know. Some from the, the musicians. I mean, the bass player, the old time bass player. Ed Garland, he'd been with Kidori's band for 40, 42 years, you know, and... Uh, you played drums in Kidor on Kidori's funeral too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I played Kidori's funeral. He was in yeah. Los Angeles? Yeah, I was in Los Angeles. Hello there. And uh, we went to... Yeah, the Ori had died. I went to Los Angeles to marry my third wife. And, uh, Barry's really good at getting married, by the way. Uh, well, I had five musicians in my band, and I suppose I had the same number of wives. Just, but anyhow, that was in my youth. Anyway, we we got to um, Kidori's funeral, and uh, there was a band called the New Salutation Brass Band. It was led by a trombone player called Gordon Mitchell. And it was a mixed band. There was a couple of colored guys in there and a couple of, um, oh, no, no Mexicans, but they was all white. And uh, 
anyway, uh, Kid Ory, the trombone player, he had died, and they shipped him to Los Angeles to bury him on uh, Mount, Mount Olivet Cemetery, I think it was. But uh, he had to go up the hill, and the two drummers were old, out and red, and uh, Sylvester Rice, and they said, we can't play drums going up that hill. We're 80 years old or something. So Alton Purnell, uh, who toured with my band in England, said, this boy plays bass drum. He can play bass drum and go up the hill. Ain't gonna bother him. So the band leader was a guy called Gordon Mitchell, a trombone player. And he said, you can play bass drum, you sure? I said, yeah, sure. He said, because we're going to play some complicated things. I said, that don't matter to me. If you've got the music for it, I can play that. And if not, I've got a ear, you know. And he said, um, well, don't play the first number because it's a funeral march and you ain't going to know it. I said, oh, okay. You'll never believe what I opened up with. Closer walk with thee. <laughs> Just a closer walk with thee. Da, da, de, de, de. I mean, I'll play that on the trumpet, the trombone, or... Whatever, there's nothing to it. So I joined in with them, and uh, I got good reports. Except the man on the cemetery he said, "Don't be coming in here smoking a cigar in the cemetery." You know, that was the only bad report I got. But imagine opening up with just a closer walk with these a funeral march and saying, "Don't play because you, you won't know it." You know. Yeah. And I played that 50,000 times with bands down here, you know. I mean, probably all the people in the audience could sing just a close walk if they had to, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and after that, it was pretty easy to get around in Los Angeles, you know. They said, that boy, he can play good. He's from London. London, Ontario? I said, no, London, England. Where's that, you know? But I mean, I didn't care. I, I just, you know, I had a good time in Los Angeles. I stayed there nine years. Did the Merv Griffin show, the Dinah Shaw show. Uh, that boy, um, oh, what's his name? Johnny Carson? Yeah. Oh, you yeah. got to tell them about that, though. Johnny Carson. Carson trying to steal your act there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we were on it with Bob Hope. You know who Bob Hope is, right? He's fabulous, you know, but can he talk? Good God Almighty, he talk more than I can. And uh, he's going on and on and on and on, and they were looking at the watches, and they said, uh, well, we can't tell him to stop talking. So Ed McMahon, that was uh, Johnny's, I don't know what, sidekick, I guess, he came over and he said, uh, look here, you were supposed to play three numbers, but now you're only going to play one because of Bob Hope. I said, well, that's all right. He's Bob Hope. You know, he was famous. We weren't famous. Uh, maybe amongst a few jazz fans. But uh, then he came back and he said, I've got one thing to tell you. Johnny wants to play drums with your band. I said, wait now. We've got one number and Johnny Carson wants to play drums. And I said, no, hell no. I mean, uh, heck no. <laughs> no. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't think of it. Um, and so uh, I never did get along too well with him. But, uh, yeah, what number we had. And he wanted to play drums with a band. It was my band, you know. Exactly, it was your band, yeah. Yeah, I mean, imagine that. And the people in the... He, he never was much of a drummer anyway, bless him, you know. But now I'll tell you, Dinah Shaw, you know who she is? Dinah Shaw, she was the opposite. She came to the rehearsal, and uh, Burt Reynolds was there. That was her boyfriend at the time. You know who he is, Burt Reynolds? Okay, well, he was there. And uh, she came in a pair of black pants and a red sweater, and man, I would have gone for her in a New York minute. I mean, I was about 24, and she was about 50. But she looked fantastic. Then... I don't know why ladies do these things, but she went and changed into this dreadful long white dress and a white top. And, but anyhow, uh, and uh, um, 
She said, can I sing a number with your band? My band was called The Legends of Jazz, and uh, I told you that before. And I said, yeah, sure, what do you want to sing? And she said, how about just a closer walk with thee? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think we can manage that. I said, what, what key you play it in? Had sing you learned it. that one yet, Barry? <laughs> yeah. I said, what key you sing it in? And she said, uh, Delphor. What key do I sing just to, she didn't even know what key she's singing in. And he said, um, A flat, I think it was, or whatever key she sang it in. And, uh, oh no, it was A natural. I said, well, I think we can get by with it, you know. It might not sound too good. And she sang with us. She was a beautiful woman. I mean, uh, beautiful to look at, beautiful to be around, you know. Not like that jackass Johnny Carson. I mean, he's, he's dead now, ain't he? Yes. Yeah, well, if I ever get up there. But, uh, and Merv Griffin, well, he was no problem at all, you know. I mean, uh, he just let you do what you want, you know. You ever played any of them shows up in Canada? No. no? Well, you were coming. Well, we don't really have that kind of stuff up there well we don't really have that kind of stuff on tv anymore it's more just like the late show and whatever else is going on out there letterman retired after that i just kind of stopped watching who david letterman remember him no oh yeah i do yeah, yeah. very never... funny though he's a very like like it would be like oh yeah led zeppelin he'd be like who but <laughs> but you do know some things like you know uh well you were friends with charlie watts too from the rolling stones charlie Watt, yeah charlie was a good friend you know Charlie Watt is? He's a drummer with the the Rolling Stones, I think it was. Wasn't it the Rolling Stones? Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying is everybody knows the Rolling Stones. and yeah, I don't know, I mean, yeah, You don't yeah. even know who the Almond Brothers are, right? Who? Exactly. Yeah, very like very focused on, on jazz, so it's pretty cool. But tell, tell them about Charlie Watts, you guys. Charlie was a hell of a good drummer. He used to come and sit in with our band. He didn't give a hoot one way or the other what kind of music it was. He could play it, you know. And he was the nicest person uh, that you ever meet. I mean, uh, he sat in with our band. I've got a photograph of him sitting in and playing with our band. And, uh, you know, he was just a nice guy, period, you know. It's a shame he died because he was a lot younger than I was. Oh, yeah? I don't know how old he was. I mean, musicians don't generally tell their age, you know. I mean, uh, most of us are so secretive. I mean, I'm 81. Yeah, 81. I've seen many things, you know. The hair is natural, too. I've got to get a haircut. Man, I've been, there's a lady who lives across the street. She cuts hair. I keep telling her. I say, I can't come down. I've got a broken ankle. That's what I'm doing with this darn stick. And uh, can you come over here and cut my hair? She said, oh, as soon as I get the time, as soon as she gets the time, damn, I'll be looking like Wild Bill Hickok before she gets the time, you know. But I don't know, you can't force them to do what they don't want to do, you know. I mean, perhaps she thought I wasn't going to pay her. I mean, most musicians are pretty cheap, you know. But uh, I, I would have given her a good tip for her to come along, you know. But um, let me think of what else I can tell them about. Uh, when you tell them the story about when you were touring Ireland and uh, the bass drum there. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a terrible story. You think it's, <laughs> it's okay to Terribly tell Terribly good, yeah. You saw we right to tell them? There's, I think so, yeah. I think they're here, ready you know? for it. You guys are ready for it, right? Okay. You ready? Okay. Uh, you, you off. You take care. Thanks for coming Oh, you're along. missing like the best story. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell it quick. I had a 28-inch bass drum, which is, comes up about, it's about twice the size of that little thing. And uh, we used to play Ireland uh, with the band, and we'd undo the bass drum and put, um, what's the nice word for them? The word you were using was prophylactics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Contraceptives. Yes, there you go. We used to stick them all around the side of the bass drum when we went to a southern Ireland. Because you can't buy them nowhere, see? And uh, people have got to, you know, uh, uh, I don't know how you'd put a gentleman would put it, <laughs> but, you know, we made more money selling those damn things. 
then we may play music. I'm not kidding you, man. We made a fortune playing, uh, selling them. People would say, oh, give me two dozen of them. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, at the end of the session, that was, or the beginning of the session, rather, otherwise the bass drum would have sounded pretty awful. You know, boop, 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 boop. But, um, yeah, and my, um, my drum outfit, the bass drum, is about this high. I still got it, even though I don't have it no more. I gave it away. It's in the Jazz Museum now. And uh, it says on it that Barry Martin's Legends of Jazz or something. I don't know what it says. But it, well, now you guys know the true story of that drum, so <laughs> you see it. Yeah. Well, but I mean, we made more money selling them damn things than we did playing the music. I mean, it was quite unbelievable. I mean, uh, but I suppose I've had an interest in life. I mean, I've, like I say, I played for two presidents, been to the White House for dinner, done all kind of things, you know. And you almost played in Cream for a minute too, right? The Queen? No, not the Queen. Cream, the band. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you said the Queen. I ain't never played for her. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she, uh, bless her. Yeah, I think, I guess so, but... Uh, well, you were at the coronation, though, when you were little, right? I was at the coronation. I sat on my daddy's shoulders, yeah, at her coronation, Elizabeth II. But uh, I never was invited to play at the, uh, what's that joint, I mean... Uh, the place, joint, the Buckingham Palace Buckingham joint? Buckingham Palace, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people get invited to play there, but I never did. It's funny, I was born there. And yet I played the White House twice for two different presidents, you know. And uh, maybe I'll tell you a little story about that. You go into this, oh, they they come to your house and ask all kind of questions. And uh, anybody ever played the White House? Not played, or been to the White House? You've been there? Well, just go. Well, I just mean there's visitors. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Well, they ask you all kind of questions, you know, and this and that and that. And then when you go there, you pull up at this gate, and the guy says, um, ID. And you show him that, and what are you doing here? Well, we're invited. We've got to play for... Ronald Reagan was the president, and his wife's name was Nancy. And uh, they show you... Yeah, they've got about four stops you've got to go through, and they... Keep asking the same questions, you know. What do you think we come here for, you know? We had to go into tradesmen's entrance, like, you know. And uh, anyway, they take you into this room, it's called the Red Room, and it's just like an Indian restaurant. Red carpets, red walls, red ceiling. And, um, and up comes a waiter with, with a tray of drinks. He said, Mr. Martin. I said, yes. He said, Jack Daniels with water back, isn't it, sir? How the hell do they know what you drink? But they know. I mean, that's one heck of a drink. Jack Daniels with water back, you know. You and uh, then all of a sudden, they know what everybody drinks. They say, what about you, vodka and lime? And you and that lady, she takes such and such. And then the doors open, and in comes Ronald Reagan. He just walks in. And I was the first one by the, the doors was just where that hat is. Whose hat is that? I don't know, actually. It's a nice oh, hat. Yeah, it's a nice hat. But anyway, and he moves Ronald Reagan. He said, I'm so glad you could come. He's glad. President of the United States in his house, you know. And uh, then comes Nancy. And she says, I got to tell you, Ronnie, Ronnie. Ronnie don't know nothing about jazz. Hello there. <laughs> Ronnie don't know nothing about jazz, but I can't wait to hear you guys play. I said, well, thank you very much, you know. And um, it was strange. And the other one I played for was that boy. Um, Ford. What's, what's his name? Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, yeah. You, she's, she's my little drum student. I'll be I've also heard her. the stories before, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll be teaching her to play. I and mean, she's very quick. She's very... Uh, Agile on the drums, and uh, so anyway, uh, where did I get to? Yeah, it's good to hear from him because he's really like, he's like, oh yeah, that guy, nah, 
you know, so <laughs> compliment from Barry means a lot, so. Well, I came up the hard way, you know, if you couldn't, you know, you'd get hired for a parade, and a parade would be like 20 hours sometimes, you know, mostly 10, the easy ones, you know, but uh, but a band, oh man, the Young Tuxedo Band, John Casimir played the E-flat clarinet, little, little squeaky clarinet, but it got above the brass of the band, and uh, I played with that band many times, you know. I recorded with one of them bands. I forget which one it was, but uh, you know, you'll be around here long enough. There's so many things going on to do. It's like now, Mardi Gras, you know, but the music ain't the same now. It's uh, a bit more what the old timers used to call it, hair and scare them. You know, it's not very organized. Some of the brass bands are, I suppose, you know, they go by my house. I live on Burgundy Street back in the Ninth Ward and uh, you come by there sometimes and nothing but the drums you can hear, you know. It's changed, very much changed, but... Uh, I, still like, I feel like there's, a, there's still a pretty good spirit. Oh, the spirit's there. always there. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they, they can feel like, because we've had this conversation before, too, um, just about how, yeah, like things are sort of modernizing and changing, even in New Orleans jazz. Um, but it is like it's so crucial to keep like these old guys playing and keep them talking and everything. So we really remember how to keep it the same rather than letting it go too far in like one direction or another, you know. So um, I mean, yeah, even, even like drum kits are interesting, too, like yeah. the uh Apparently it was on North Rampart Street, which is like just over here. Uh, that was where the actual drum kit, like the trap kit was born. And a lot of people don't realize that is because beforehand, like there was like the vaudeville acts back in the day and they had, uh, they had like a separate uh, bass drum player and a separate snare drum player like they do in the marching bands. And they weren't getting paid a lot though. So someone figured out, well, I mean, maybe we could just combine it all together and have one person play both the things. That's right. So then they, they did that, and it's so interesting, too, that, like, New Orleans birthed the trap kit for the world, but is now one of the only places where you're going to find, like, really true marching band music where there's still a separate snare and a separate uh, bass drum. So it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, you got to have the two drums because the snare drum just, you play all the time. You never stop playing. When the band stops playing its music, da 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 bum the snare drum got to march the band, da Tip, 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 ram, tip, tip. The snare drum don't never stop playing in the old time brass bands. In these modern brass bands, they hardly ever start playing. They don't about stop, you know. I mean, they just say go by my house sometimes. But in the olden days, man, those praise would go on. Oh Lord, I mean, all day long. But the music would be so fantastic. I mean, it's uh, it's just. Um, but it was very, the Eureka Brass Band was run by Percy Humphrey, and he was a strict leader. Believe me, he was a strict leader, you know. Um, I remember once I was at a funeral, not playing, I just went to see it. And uh, you wear black hats for a funeral, and white shirts and black ties and black pants, so everything black and white. And uh, there was a trump trumpet player who should remain nameless, Thomas Jefferson. He came there, and uh, he had a white cap on. And Percy said, rah, 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 rah. And uh, he said, man, what you telling me? What difference does it make? He said, it's my band. Black hat, white hat, no play. He said, I'm going to take you to the union. And Percy said, I am in the union. He said, I'm one of the, <laughs> one of the board. So uh, he never did do it, but yeah, he sent him home without any money. They never paid much anyway. The funerals in those days paid ten dollars, twelve dollars if you was lucky. But you stopped and got the, the people with the body stopped every so often, especially across the river, and bought you all beers, bought beers for the band, you know, whiskey, whatever you wanted, you know. But nobody seemed to get drunk on those things, you know. Probably all the marching, you're just metabolizing it the whole time, so. I don't know what that means, metabolizing, but uh, 
You mean, uh, what's that mean, heavy metal? No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's it's when uh, when your body like works works it through its system or whatever. So you're not feeling the alcohol then, you know, because you're busy walking. So well, and the other thing was, I hate to be so this ladies present, but there wasn't nowhere you could take a pee. Where where are you going to take a pee on the funeral parade? You know, you had to cut off into the woods or something, and uh, you know. And then you'd be way behind the band. You'd have to run. To yeah, you had to run again. to catch up with them. Do bass drum. Yeah. But those those. Be those careful not to go that fast, though. You screw the whole thing up. Wasn't man, that happening at Kid Ori's funeral too? You guys were marching up, and then someone started playing too fast because you were walking up the hill yeah, too fast. Or yeah, something. we were walking downhill then. Oh yeah. Okay. And they, they, they increased the tempo going downhill. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what they were doing, but uh, I did my part, and it's on. Um, yeah, it's on some, some, one of these, I don't have television modern things, uh, well, I've got television, but not, it's on one of these programs, Kid Ori's Funeral, you know, and you see me playing the bass drum, they didn't know who the hell I was, let alone that I could play the bass drum, they didn't want me to, like I told you, and don't play the first number because you ain't going to know it, Closer Walk with the Funeral March, can you believe it? And I've been playing that since I was peeing in my diapers, you know. And, uh, excuse my language, but, uh, you know, the, the, it's funny. The funerals nowadays, I don't know, I ain't been to one for a long time. I'm trying to think of the last funeral I went to. We played that funeral, that jazz funeral for that chap uh, last spring, right? Who that was? Remember we played it at the house? Oh, yeah, the yeah, house. yeah. That was right across from my house. Yeah, it was an old-time funeral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, um, don't you, ain't none of you here works for the police, is it? Yeah? No, because I lied to them. I can't walk too far. And I said, we can't get a police permit for the police to accompany us to the river, which is about two blocks from my house, but I couldn't walk two blocks because of my ankle. So they said, oh, well, we, we'll take the ashes to the river and dump them in, and then we'll come back and you play happy music. I said, yeah, that's what we have to do. I said, them damn cops. But uh, so that's what we did, and they never knew. But, uh, yeah, I couldn't walk that two blocks with a leg like, uh, ankle like this, you know. Anybody got any questions? Boy, what a bunch. <laughs> Well, I got a question for you, Barry. How did you start? Like, what? How did you start playing drums? When did you start playing drums? Oh, my daddy had a minstrel troupe. It was called the Virginia Minstrels, and uh, they had all these instruments at the house. And they had the snare drum. This thing was about that big, and about round as that table. It was about damn near the size of that table. I could barely lift it. And I started playing on that. I don't know why. And, uh, and my daddy, when he came back from the war, he uh, he formed up that troupe again, and I played with them. And uh, it was good, you know. But I don't know, you just get a feeling for something. I know you know what I'm talking about. If, uh, if you've got a feeling for something you're doing that you really enjoy, and the wife... Wives will encourage you, and uh, the friends will, you know, the friends will say, "Oh, it's great what you're doing," you know. And um, there's very few people that criticize. I mean, thank heaven. But uh, it's so different now, though. If you play a funeral, man, you, I don't know what they'd be doing, you know. I'm glad I'm, I ain't going to brass band play for my funeral. Good God. But. Uh, and you never knew the corpse, you know. Well, you never knew them. Sometimes you knew them, but very seldom. You know, you had to find out what their name was. And, uh, and then you kiss the coffin goodbye if you knew him. And then they go in there and then you play happy music coming back. You know, and everything is uh, happy coming back from the funeral, but going to it. Man, it's funny. Do they have them in Canada? 
Oh uh, yeah, once in a while there's some jazz funerals, but it's not it's not that common, you know. It's in Toronto or Montreal, sometimes they put yeah. them on. But well, you told us how you started playing. Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 Anyways, you still have the same snare drum that you've always had, right? That yeah. first one that you got there. I still got the same snare drum. Yeah, it's the same one that Paul Barron used. It's a premier, it's an English drum. I don't know what he was doing with the English drum, but he loved it, and. Uh, I played his Paul's drum many times, and um, you know, if you played a funeral, then would be happy music. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Wait a minute. You mind if I take a drink of this water? He's taking a sip of water right now, but I think. Uh, that may just conclude our program. Give it up for Barry Martin and Miss Kate, huh? <laughs> it's always nice to have you here. You want to say one last thing before we, we say yeah. goodbye? How the hell do you get this open? Oh, well, I got you, I got you, I got you. You got it? That's one thing about the National Park Service. They're pretty smart. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Barry Martin, and thank you, Kate. Thank you to New Orleans Jazz Museum. And for the viewers out on Facebook, you just want to say thank you to Kate. Um, he said thank you to you all, if you didn't hear him in the mic. And again, our mission for the National Park is to basically instill an appreciation for New Orleans jazz music and the musicians that come in and continue um, sharing the torch. Please check out neworleansnolajazzmuseum.org for programs here and nps.gov backslash jazz for programs at our park. See you next time. You mean to tell me we've been here to talking for an hour? Man, it seemed like 10 minutes to me, but I thank you, all you people. I want to thank every one of you for coming. Come back and see the next show, whoever's on it.